Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. My name is Rob H., and this week I'm here with... Lee Overstreet, pinch hitting for a variety of AV Rant personnel reasons. Yeah, this is... Uh... We th- we thought it was makeshift before. This 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 is something else here. So first and yeah. foremost, we are hoping that by the time you hear this, uh, Tom and his family have the all clear and that they are back in their house. They have evacuated uh, Hurricane Ian. Uh, we're they're recording this on a Tuesday, so at yep. this point, I think it's like a category two or category three. I'm not sure where it is as as we're recording this even, but uh, potentially making landfall on the west side of Florida where Tom lives. So they've been ordered to evacuate. He's uh, He said he was like shifting everything on his house, in his house around to try and prepare for like up to 10 to 12 feet of water maybe coming in. So uh, I don't know what elevation he lives at. Yeah. Uh, I've been to his house and what a lovely place. And um, I'm stressed right along with him hearing about it yeah so that that is the explanation for why there was no ta- tom andrew on this podcast this week you can hear it from the horrible quality of my audio i'm still on my headset i'm not even in my parents house right now i'm in my car i'm recording this from a car <laughs> along with lee overstreet who is pinch hitting on short notice this <laughs> yeah. is this is yeah, as basically came, as it gets i came jogging into my office you know and i'm like plugging things in realizing that I still had my computer and all the electronics in this office unplugged from the last time we had a storm. There you go. I hadn't done anything just what this we week needed. in here. And so <laughs> it's just, this has given me flashbacks to that college radio show I used to do where things worked when it wanted to. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So uh, in any event, I mean, nothing's happening at my place. I don't know. It's been like four weeks of nothing happening in my oh, apartment. So it's man. just waiting for stuff behind the scenes to get sorted out by someone. I, the, the, the nothing I can do. So it's, uh, yeah, everything's kind of a bit of a downer this week. But regardless, we're like, we will press on. There will be AV rant in some form or fashion. I don't know how long the batteries on my laptops are going to last. So that we might just cut out at the end without any ceremony yeah. whatsoever. Who it knows? might just end abruptly with like a notice. Like, at the end saying that is the end (laughs) i was i was that's more work than i want to do to put that text into the video so this is going to be this is going to be a low key uh just just hanging in there by our fingernails episode of av rant but nonetheless we are here this uh let's see should i do intros first how do we do this thing we talk about what we watch first that's what we do intro in that so uh so i i have not watched much i watched the first episode and only the first episode of andor the new uh star wars series on disney plus so uh they they released three episodes all at once which i've heard uh through just you know the online reviews and stuff that it does take a while to get going so it kind of takes those first three episodes to get into it from episode one only i certainly felt that way i'm like don't really know why I'm meant to sort of care about anybody just yet at this point. Like, I remember Rogue One. I can't really say I remember Cassie and Andor's character super strongly. I remember Jin Erso a lot more than Cassie and Andor. So, like, yeah, I recognize him. And this is taking place, like, five years before Rogue One as a prequel. So, yeah, it's all kind of set up at this point. I didn't really feel myself attaching to anything just yet uh but hey we got star wars's first stuttering robot stuttering droid so oh there you go yeah. you know that that's something new <laughs> well i would watch it just like i did mandalorian but yep. uh this this time i don't have free disney plus by accident ah, from right. someone you remember <laughs> when someone used the wrong email address and gave me access okay. to their disney plus I, that's how i watched mandalorian <laughs> uh, that's how cheap i am oh uh, well what what has lee overstreet watched <laughs> Well, I watched a movie from the past about the future and a movie from modern times about the past. That sounds about right. So, right. So to, to talk about two different things, I, I watched the movie 1917, finally, uh, about World War One, and, and famously uh, made to look like they shot it in one big long shot. Right. Yeah. As though it's, it were all a mm-hmm. single take. There, There's yeah. plenty of trickery going on. There were, in yes. fact, cuts. They did not manage to shoot oh. the entire movie in a single take, but uh, clever I editing. I kind of tell maybe a 10 or 12 different shots honestly but even still it's quite an accomplishment and that was a really good movie great and uh you know if you have a good surround sound system and some subwoofers uh there are some things exploding Mm -hmm. and it's pretty exciting uh but that's just a stressful movie like Mm. don't watch it if you're in not a good place and if you're not in a good state of mind that's a (laughs) stressful movie it really i watched it late at night like let me see what this is about and by the end of it i'm like well okay let's chill out and go to sleep now Uh, yes on the technical side i should mention hopping back to uh andor there i'm pretty sure that on disney plus that's coming in at 
actual integer 24 frames per second rather than the 23.976 oh, really? cuz i was getting that little micro stutter at the oh. rather you know the interval where a frame just gets dropped because it's the integer 24 frames per second now this is over at my parents place it's on an amazon fire tv 4k stick mm. so mm -hmm. um maybe it's frame rate matching you know just isn't up to snuff on that thing but i was i was getting mm. that weird little frame drop frame skip um on that so though if other people have noticed that that might be the reason it might be the integer 24 frames per that second i think that would be weird why would they do that that that's... that's the way things are going now that, that a lot of a lot of productions are moving towards integer 24 frames per second now so okay yeah well, i guess it's just up to all of us to have equipment that does it right <laughs> that's huh? right it's gonna be one more thing <laughs> if you notice that weird little frame skip here and there and then uh also on the techno sky i just had to mention like uh, i'm pretty sure they're doing this on the volume as they are with the mandalorian the gigantic led screen that's in the background that has all the uh, backgrounds rendered in real time so that the perspective stays correct when they move the camera doing that all in the unreal engine uh but yeah. i did just notice in the first episode like every shot was the same length of time and every time someone walked anywhere they walked the exact same distance in every shot huh. and i'm like <laughs> i'm starting to starting to catch on to seeing when they're filming on the volume because it's like it well i mean in a way it's like a throwback to the stage play days right like that's the size right. of the stage you had to play on that's and right. uh i'm just finding it interesting that i'm like oh, I'm, I'm starting to notice it in the show now it's like yep when they walked from point a to point b and then they went into an alley and then they went into a bar and then they went to an outdoor area was the same distance and the same length that's, of shot every single time <laughs> that's fascinating yeah like in the extremely early days of movies everything was on a set that was no right. more than about 20 feet across that's right yeah and everything had to happen in that and in fact the other movie i watched recently just last night was from the mid 30s so they had bigger sets mm -hmm. you know, like small warehouse size sets at that point but you could tell hey, the sets were only so big yeah uh, it was a movie called things to come uh -huh. which is uh, a movie version of an H.G. Wells uh, 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 book. Okay. And it was about the future and what was going to happen in the future. Some things very prescient, predicting World War II. Mm. Uh, other things, not as much. Mm -hmm. uh, but they did predict uh, uh, space travel going to the moon. Yep. The latter part of the movie is in like the year 2036. Okay. But uh, just like... Just like all throughout history, trying to predict the future, even if you're very close yeah. to a new thing that's about to happen, like computers, for yes. instance. <laughs> yes. You know, ten, 10 years or so away from the first computers this movie was made, mm. uh, there wasn't a computer in sight on right. into the 2030s. So yeah. that, that was kind of fun. But it, I, it's kind of fun to watch uh, a, a modern movie about the past that's in perfect visual 4K quality mm -hmm. and good surround sound. Uh, and, and then you watch a movie from the 30s about today and it's in mono and grainy black and white and it's just an interesting experience <laughs> it felt the audio is very harsh in the uh, films well that's uh that that's an interesting one i've never i've never seen i, I don't think i've even heard of it as a movie form so yeah. that might be I worth checking out really old sci-fi yeah. like what how much did they get right about today or the future uh and that's a that's a good one ah. if, you, if you're into that sort of thing well, just to warn everybody, if there is noise coming in, as I mentioned, I'm recording from my car, so there's noise all around me. I don't know how good this headset is at being somewhat directional and picking up my voice. I'll be denoising after, but the noise <laughs> is shifting since it's not like just a yeah. steady state constant thing. There's different noises around, so that's the warning. The, the, this is what we get this week. Uh, but yeah, oh, oh, uh, for, for for the record, everyone, he's not in motion. He's parked. No, yeah. He's indeed, not driving yeah. around town doing the podcast. I he's should not do that, that next busy. week just to, just, <laughs> to say we, awesome. just to say we we tried yeah <laughs> you could do that you got 5g <laughs> i don't have 5g actually what i uh, know i'm 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 with shaw which is like a primarily a home service and they like undercut everybody on price just to gain customers so they don't have any 5g going yet here well, I don't know how you're going to melt your brain without 5G. That's, Come on. that's right. So uh, anyway, yeah, let's let people know what the heck they're listening to. It's uh, it's AV Rant. This is your yeah. home theater and AV questions answered. To get your question answered, all you have to do is email us. Our email address is question at avrant.com. You can come to our website, which is of course is avrant.com. You can see our show notes there. There are time stamps to take you to every person's question. And uh, we've got uh, a link to our Flickr album in every single episode as well. 
well. So uh, images will be shown on YouTube. And if you'd like to see those images uh, just on your own time, you can use the Flickr albums to do that. All sorts of ways to get in touch with us. Uh, the primary one is that email address, question at avrant.com, but you can find us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. And on YouTube, where we are uh, at the address, youtube.com slash avrant. So, uh, yeah, you can get in touch with us individually. Uh, over on Twitter, Tom is at avrant underscore Tom. Uh, I am at First Reflect. And uh, Lee Overstreet, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, I am at Lee Overtweet. Because I'm hilarious, mm -hmm. uh, Lee Overstreet being my name, Lee Overtweet being my uh, uh, username there. Or if you're curious about electric cars, follow me at Tesla Lusa. That's right. He likes the puns. Lee likes the puns. Yeah. I'm from Tuscaloosa. Have a Tesla. So Tesla. <laughs> That's Lusa. right. Uh, you can also uh, email Tom and I directly <laughs> if you want to. That is uh, Tom at avrant.com or Rob at avrant.com. You can figure out which one of those goes to which one of us. It's it's yeah. quite the code for everyone to break there. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's thank our listeners of the week. Listeners of the week, of course, are people who have supported the podcast in some way. We have financial supporters. Now, some people send us a one-time donation uh, via PayPal. You can do that through our website avrant.com and over on the right hand side of the desktop version of avrant.com mm. you can find a link that says support avrant with an image of a cup of coffee and that'll take you to paypal uh, i don't know if there were any paypal donors this week tom is the only one who really looks at that so uh yeah there might have been and if we missed any hopefully tom will be back next week and we'll be able to thank anybody who donated via paypal uh, we're gonna find out a lot post hurricane that is definitely going to be the case but i can definitely say we have patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash avrant podcast you can go there and sign up to make an automatic monthly donation if you please one dollar per month is the minimum and then you can fall asleep on the number on your keyboard and make that number go <laughs> as high as you want we won't complain zero uh, zero, we... zero 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 that's zero. right that'd be just fine uh but yeah we have 138 patrons over there at patreon.com slash avrant podcast so a big big thank you to all of you for your continued financial support also want to thank Dale P, who sent me directly an Amazon Canada gift card. Uh, oh. I wanted to help out with uh, future costs to cover my apartment repairs, so very, yeah. very much appreciate that. Thank you, Dale. Now, people can send money to Tom if they want to, because he's going to have repairs most likely after this darn hurricane coming he's through. He's going to have something. There's no way he's getting away scot-free on this situation, We would kind but he is evacuating. So kind of expect it. Yeah, there is a reason for that evacuate. Hopefully it's one of those better safe than sorry. That is what we have our fingers crossed that that Absolutely. ends up being the result but yeah could be could be some devastation over there so who knows what will happen and mm -hmm. uh, along those lines there are people who have continued to send us notes of gratitude just for keeping the podcast going in some form or fashion by hook or by crook there is an av rant episode almost mm -hmm. every week so yeah we're we're doing our best over here and we got notes of gratitude from dale Aris Jim. Uh, Jim offered what I would uh, I would I would term a, a slightly backhanded compliment because he was saying <laughs> that my current makeshift audio via my headset. Um, he's noticed that Tom's voice usually starts out quite loud, but then he'll say something so quietly that you can barely hear him. At least in the audio uh, only version, where uh, I haven't applied any uh, dynamic range compression, and Tom doesn't do so either. So uh, he was saying that my current audio through the headset is like kind of closer to tom so he's finding himself riding the volume knob a little bit less as a result so all right wh whatever works there, uh, I, I do dynamically compress our audio on the youtube version so uh yeah, so maybe yeah. that maybe that'd be more to your liking you can you can just download that or something and then that, that that might work that might be more <laughs> to your liking jim uh but we also got a note from uh, gorinder he said he was glad to hear that my covid symptoms were not terrible at all and they certainly weren't i'm completely symptom free now so very very mild case of it although i did i did test positive mildly so yep. so uh, i he did says, have it again recently too oh my goodness there we go right my it's... wife and i both had it again just <sighs> a few weeks ago well, and, uh, it wasn't yes. nearly as bad as that first time, right. and it wasn't nearly as scary as when I had it in late March 2020. For sure. When, when no one knew what to do about it and what it was going to do to you. So, yeah, uh, now, now time... you've been vaccinated, boosted. And... Yes, yes. 
Uh, I mean, I take it by you being here and not coughing every two seconds that your symptoms are not too, too terrible at this moment. So, Oh, this is weeks ago. Okay. So I'm, I'm perfectly fine. It, it only lasted about a week for me and really only bad for about two days. So yeah. much better than last time. So, yeah, use the technology available to you, namely for vaccines sure. and boosters. So yeah, that if helped this is a lot. An endemic thing like the flu was, then we'll just keep up with our vaccinations and hopefully that uh, keeps it all manageable. That That is fingers crossed again on that. Mm. Uh, but yeah, getting back to uh, Gurinder, he says he can sympathize with Tom having gotten gla- uh, just gotten glasses with progressive lenses. Uh, he started wearing them himself, and they definitely take some getting used to. Lee was mentioning before we started recording, he's going progressive lenses too. So Yeah, just, just I can sort of get away without them uh-huh. uh, because uh, I wear these sort of thin <laughs> glasses anyway, and I can kind of peek down below the glasses to right. see things up close. But I realize I don't want to uh, uh, make old people face maneuvers do you know what i mean like is something it's gonna yeah, happen like, lee yeah you might well, as what well I mean just is bite like, the bullet when if you look over the top of your glasses at something or you mm-hmm. look underneath your glasses at something that's that is a real like that'll age you real fast <laughs> Anyone looking at you knows exactly what's going I'm on. I'm looking and, forward to Tom doing that once we get back to video. That's that's going to be fun for everyone well, to see. I, I feel for him, like everything <laughs> he was saying about yep. how like, well, you know, my vision's not bad. I just have to wear glasses to focus. <laughs> like, yeah, I used to say that. I got my first pair of glasses when I was 19. I literally remember telling someone, uh, oh, I don't wear glasses. I just got these recently. Right. <laughs> like, but you have them on. You, yeah. So it's. It's tough to change. (laughs) Well, continuing on with our notes of gratitude, uh, Dale P. also wrote to us. He says he appreciates that we are continuing the show in some form or fashion on YouTube, but he, for one, does miss seeing our faces, so he'll be happy when we're back to normal. He also says keep up the good work, so thank you very much, Dale. We will look forward when we are back to normal. That is is someday in the future, but uh, just just hanging in there for now, trying to not get too depressed and ignore all of that sort of stuff. Uh, Daz wrote in as well yeah uh, apologies from me to daz uh, he wrote in last week about uh painting his front wall with sherwin williams tricorn black paint and i i somehow wrote down his comment under the wrong name so we said the wrong name along with that it happens oh. uh, certainly not intentional but my apologies to you daz he very kindly let me know of that error uh and That's then we also got uh, notes from matt luke greg and nathan nathan saying he hopes tom and his family are able to stay safe through the hurricane so we are uh, all on board with that thank you so much yes. to all of you thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions so uh, we do have lots of questions this week and uh, we've also got some news so lee why don't you kick us off with our first news story let's plow through some news (laughs) through some news i promise i haven't had a single thing to drink it's (laughs) middle of the day Denon's 2022 and 2023 AV receivers are official with the X3800H even available for purchase, although it has sold out quickly. So there's that. And the newly named Cinema Series from Marantz is official too, although all of their models are only listed as coming soon. Everything comes soon nowadays. (laughs) It used to be that a product would come out and then it would be promoted, and you could go buy it. (laughs) And now a product is promoted, then you buy it, then it comes out. (laughs) That's what happens now, whether it's cars or electronics or phones, whatever. It goes the other way. The previously leaked information that we detailed a few weeks ago seems to have been mostly correct. Uh, The higher-end Denon X3800H, X4800H, and A1H all get four independent subwoofer outputs, as do the Marantz Cinema 50, which replaces the SR6015, Cinema 40, which replaces the 7015. So now the numbers are getting smaller smaller. as the price and features go up. So Marantz flipped it around. It's something we're just going to have to get used to, that the smaller the number of the model, the higher in the lineup it is. But it's the reverse. Over at Denon, they left it the same. So the higher the model number in Denon, the higher the price and features. So See, I yeah. like the Marantz method, frankly, because okay. it's almost like a ranking. The, the smaller <laughs> right. number means it's at the top, right? <laughs> right, right, and right. And also, it's less numbers because humans don't talk in numbers. We talk in words. Mm-hmm. So Cinema 40, to me, is easier just to say. I don't mind that as a model name whatsoever. Yeah, that's, right. that's better than the spaghetti mess of models and letters and numbers that we so often get. That's right. There's also a flagship AV10 dedicated pre-pro. 
Uh, the flagship Denon A1H receiver gets 15 channels of amplification built in to power a full 9.4.6 configuration all on its own, uh, while the Marantz AV10 Pre Pro gets 17.4 pre outs, both RCA and XLR. That must be huge. <laughs> to allow connection of different overhead speakers that will switch depending on your chosen listening mode, 15 speakers can be used at once, and all their HDMI ports support 4K 120 and 8K 60. Uh, the rumors about Dirac Live being an optional add-on, they all come with Odyssey, are true, except not out of the box. Uh, Dirac is promised as a future firmware update with Dirac Live costing $400 extra. Do you think that's worth it? Um, honestly, <laughs> no. I, no. I, I don't yeah. really. I'm glad that there's going to be the option. There will, of course, be oh, yeah. the people who want to just compare and try it out. But you know how we feel about anything that doesn't arrive out of the box these days. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that is promised via a future firmware update. Now, I do expect that at some point, Dirac really will arrive on these Den and Emirates AV receivers and pre-pros via a future firmware update. On all the previous things where Dirac was a future firmware update from other brands, it did eventually arrive. It sometimes took two or three years from when it yep. was announced. They're saying it should be sometime in 2023 for these Denon and Marantz models. So I don't really doubt that it will eventually come. But if you are having plans to make that comparison anytime soon, I would not hold your breath. Yes, I've grown weary of this new thing we do nowadays where nothing is ever finished. Indeed. The, the product you buy, you, you, you buy it ahead of time and then it gradually gets to where you expected it. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the 7.2 channel Denon X2800H and S970H get three HDMI 2.1 ports, just like the S660H, S760H and X1700H that remain in the lineup. Also sticking with 7.2 are the new Marantz Slimline Cinema 70S model, as well as the Cinema 60 that replaces the SR5015. According to the specs, the Cinema 70 Slimline gets a full set of 7.2 pre-outs. Mm -hmm. uh, prices weren't all correct. The x 2800H, X3800H, and X4800H are all more expensive than the models they're replacing, not less expensive, as the earlier rumors had suggested. $1,200, $1,700, and $2,500, respectively. The flagship A1H's rumored price of $6,500 turned out to be true. So, ouch. <laughs> and that's American dollars, right? Sure We're not is. doing that Canadian right dollars. now. That is U.S. <laughs> dollars. And for Marantz. MSRPs are expensive. The Cinema 70 is $1,200. Cinema 60 goes for $1,700. Cinema 50 is $2,500 as compared to its Denon sister model, the $1,700 X3800H. And Cinema 40 is $3,500. And the only new Cinema Series Marantz receiver to get a full front panel display, not just the little porthole display hidden behind its drop-down front panel. The AV-10 Pre-Pro does indeed cost a whopping $7,000. <laughs> and, and Rob, can you put an echo on that? Uh, uh, and it, I'm sure it's possible, you're, you're but editing, no, I'm not going to. <laughs> $7,000. They're all listed as coming soon, mm -hmm. except for the X3800H. And interestingly, according to the X3800H's manual, you can now opt to use its 11 channels of processing as a 5.4.6 configuration rather than 7.4.4. And then there's the new directional setting when using two, three, or four uh, subwoofers. Uh, <laughs> directional, Rob. Uh, directional subwoofers. Aim the aim the subwoofer driver directly at your face. It's very important. Uh, yep. <laughs> this horrible option will output the dedicated LFE channel from all subwoofers together, but it will only reroute the bass from speakers to the single subwoofer that is closest to them. Yeah because that's how it works what's yeah. happening rob uh well they're they're providing <laughs> plenty of fodder for future questions for av oh, rant right, seriously um yes. yeah i mean i might as well just comment on this right now loud look sure, yeah, i yeah, understand yeah, yeah. where this came from there are plenty of people who requested 
this feature where they say, look, if I have just two subwoofers, but I put them both at the front of my room, one to the left and one to the right, then I want the subwoofer on the left to only play with the speakers that are on the left side of my room. And I want the subwoofer that's on the right to only play with the speakers that are on the right side of the room because so many people still adhere to the misguided idea that ideally each and every speaker would be completely full range that mm. your surround speakers, your surround backs, your fronts, of course, would all be completely full range and that we're only crossing over to subwoofers because the speakers themselves can't play all the way down to 20 hertz. So we're forced to, we're forced to make this oh. compromise of having the <laughs> subwoofer fill in the lowest couple of octaves. But ideally, it would, you know, that sound would be emanating from the same place as all the mid range and high frequencies. Now, Anybody who's listened to AV Rant for any length of time knows that we completely disagree with this. We mm, refer yeah. to the Harmon research done by Sean Olive and Todd Welty that demonstrates really, really clearly mathematically and in real world measurements that that is not the way you want to handle base management, that what we nope. want is available as a setting. In fact, it's now a little bit of a better setting, setting this standard subwoofer mode that mm. you can now. So what used to happen was, um, you know, if you if you plugged in each of your subwoofers to an independent subwoofer output, there were only being two of them on the Den and Amarances, that, you know, it would set independent distances and levels, and then it would EQ them together. That's still going to ha happen in the standard mode, but at least you're just getting a mono signal coming out when you set the subwoofer mode to standard mode. So you could right. connect three or four subwoofers, but to put it in standard mode, at least they're just getting a mono signal. That is what we want. The Odyssey automatic setup is still going to attempt to set individual uh, distances and levels. We're not super keen on that being the way that it's done, but as long as you're getting that mono signal EQ'd as one, all two, three, or four subwoofers playing together and EQ'd together, that is the setting that we're going to recommend all the time. It's the default. It's available. So I'm good with all of that. It's just, right. of course, people are going to be tempted to try out this directional setting that we do not want whatsoever. I hate that it once you use that directional setting, it opens up this subwoofer layout options, which if you're using two speakers, you can set them up as either left and right or front and rear. Yamaha mm. was already doing that with horrible results. You know, right. really uneven bass across your spe uh, seats, especially if you do that front and rear thing where now, you know, the subwoofer at the back of the room is only playing when there are sounds in your surround back speakers or your surround speakers or your rear height speakers. Like it's a complete ridiculous. It's, way it's to utterly it ridiculous. Well, I think, you know, the, the, the problem is people have a hard time understanding anything that is invisible. Sure. There's a lot of confusion in our modern world about things like radio waves and vaccines and subwoofer frequencies, mm -hmm. things that are invisible to the naked eye get a lot of uh, conspiracy theories <laughs> and a lot of bad physics. So, you I mean, know? like I said, I can, uh, I can understand the thought process where this came from, even the request for it. But yeah, I'm, I'm not happy that it's there. I really don't like the, if you have three subwoofers set up, there's only one option in the subwoofer layout, which is front left sub, front right sub, and a single rear sub. Which mm. I'm like, Ugh, my goodness, again, that rear sub's only going to be playing with your surround back speakers, surrounds and rear heights. Uh, and then, of course, if you're doing a uh, four subwoofer setup, it's front left, front right, rear left, rear right. So they're going for the four corners of the room, right. which is not bad. Uh, but again, it's going to be that the subwoofer in the front left is only playing along with your front left speaker and your front height left speaker, you know. So that is not the way we want to do it. But uh, you know, it's there. Uh, we've detailed it. We've talked for years and years at this point about why we don't like doing it. But I thought it was interesting that this exists now as a setting wanted to draw some attention to it. But our recommendation is going to be connect as many subwoofers as you want to. At least two is going to be our recommendation, but we're fine with you doing three or four for sure. But mm -hmm. stick to the standard subwoofer mode. That's right. going to be the recommendation around here mm -hmm. at AV Rant. Sub frequencies are not directional in your living room. Hmm. It's not a thing. But then there is an excellent new option to use the subwoofer four pre-out specifically for tactile transducers. Yeah. Uh, 
EQ will not be applied to this pre-out, and you can set its crossover and level independently from the other three subwoofer pre-outs. Now, that is a thing that'll that make a difference. is cool. I am, yeah. I, Tom and I actually talked about this. Tom said, like, this is something I would like for AV receiver manufacturers to do is have a dedicated tactile transducer pre-out so that we don't have to do the crazy thing of running through your room correction, then sending your subwoofer pre-out into something like a mini DSP where you can like reverse engineer and like undo <laughs> yeah. the correction that your room <laughs> correction did to uh, give your tactile transducer a flat non eq signal. Now it's built right into the new Den and Amaranthus that have the four subwoofer pre out So that's the 3800H and up in the Denon lineup or the Cinema 50 and down, I guess, numerically, right? The Cinema 50, right. Cinema 40 and uh, uh, AV10 Pre-Pro. So the ones that have four subwoofer pre-outs, uh, you'll be able to do this, the, the, the sub out four, uh, can be set as a dedicated tactile transducer output. So I'm really happy and excited to see that. You would still be able to use three other independent subwoofers. Uh, so, I mean, we're still going to recommend probably using two of the output jacks. Even mm -hmm. if you have four subs, we'll just Y split two of the subwoofer output jacks. Mm -hmm. That's probably the way we're going to recommend setting things up here at AV Rent. Uh, but yeah, using that pre out number four, subwoofer pre out number four as a tactile transducer dedicated pre out, really happy about that. So that's proof that, yeah, they're giving people what they want, whether it's better or worse. Sure. <laughs> In this case, it's better. All right, moving on. Google is looking to offer alternatives to Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. Of course they are. Royalty-free, which ain't bad, and without any licensing fees and based upon existing codecs, quote-unquote. Mm. This is primarily for YouTube, which doesn't support Dolby Vision or Atmos at all at the moment but also for Android and Google TV. Uh, technical details are scarce right now, but it seems likely they intend to use HDR10 Plus and multidimensional audio all within an AV1 container, the video type. Uh, that might also uh, allow existing hardware devices that are capable of supporting AV1 to utilize Google's versions of dynamic metadata HDR and immersive audio via software updates rather than requiring entirely new chips. But that's just speculation. Google is referring to all of this as Project Caviar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Project Caviar. So, I mean, of course, all <laughs> we needed the in the world of HDR and immersive audio were new formats. Right. Uh, that, that's all we needed is to make that Venn diagram even more complicated about which devices support which codecs and all that kind of fun stuff. However, their whole thing about using existing codecs, but just giving it their own branding and their own container. I mean, it is speculation. Mm -hmm. Give some hope to the idea that maybe existing devices could be updated to be able mm -hmm. to support this stuff. Uh, but I mean, it's almost certainly using that AV1 codec. So if your current device doesn't do AV1, then you know that's that's almost certainly going to require an update. There's there's I if I'm making a bet and a prediction, I, I think it's highly unlikely it's anything other than an AV1 container. <laughs> Yeah, this. almost certainly. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I will say uh, royalty free and no licensing fees is a nice thing. Like that's, uh, a, that's a positive thing, I think. I mean, this is more about they're trying to negotiate with Dolby in the background. This is my speculation because yeah, maybe. I'm pretty darn sure that the folks that, you know, uh, doing the Google TV stuff and YouTube were like, hey, Dolby, how much is it going to cost? And they're like, here's our standard licensing fee. And they're like, but we're Google. We want to pay yeah, yeah, yeah. zero. But if we have to pay something, it has to be less than everybody else. And Dolby was probably like, no. And they're like, well, then we'll just do our own thing. So yeah. honestly, if I, if again, if I'm placing a bet, I'd be willing to bet that we do end up in the future with Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos at some point, like even on YouTube TV. I just figure that this is a bit of gamesmanship to try and negotiate the licensing fee from Dolby down. Mm. That's that's what I think is really going on. Well, here. You're probably right. But even like if if they can't negotiate and mm -hmm. this thing is royalty free and works. Sure. Then if other th that can drive prices down on other things. Yeah, I've seen some magnificent HDR uh, via YouTube on the uh, LG OLED, like absolutely gorgeous. So it's completely capable already. And that's that's just HDR10 or HLG. Right. I mean, the, those HLG are a lot. Yeah, no metadata assigned or um, 
metadata, right. but not any dynamic metadata. If, if right, right, right. metadata is I do, it's the single piece of metadata that just comes in at the beginning of the content, no frame by frame or scene by scene dynamic metadata with those formats. So yeah, I, I'm still on the train of let's just make everything PQ10 and let our displays frame by yeah. frame analyze it and do dynamic tone mapping. I would, I would rather it's all just handled that way, but I've said that before. Nobody's listening to me on that front, so there you go. Well, the 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 smartness of the computers and the displays are getting there. Yeah. And so it it will make the dynamic. Uh, oh yeah, you've got the processing power now built into the displays that they can just analyze it frame by frame, do dynamic tone mapping, no dynamic metadata necessary. But whatever they want to have. I a think you're right. <laughs> you're right. I got gotcha. you. All right. How about some questions Let's on this shout. question? question podcast we have let's do some questions nick had a question uh nick had a quick blackout several months ago i hope that means his power and not himself <laughs> power went out okay good and almost immediately came back on prior to that power event his onkyo 805 receiver was working fine after it was dead mm. i've had that happen uh nick has a whole house surge protection unit on his main panel then he also had his onkyo plugged into a trip light surge protector all of his other home theater gear was plugged into that same trip light and it's all fine only the onkyo died mm. i've had that happen yeah <laughs> trip light took months to examine his surge protector and get back to him regarding their warranty coverage for items plugged into their surge protectors they ultimately said they couldn't find any evidence of surge damage so they won't pay to replace his onkyo of course. <laughs> but they said they'd offer him some free trip light units since the evaluation took so long. Oh, okay. He might appeal the claim, having found someone knowledgeable enough to evaluate his Onkyo's power supply and motherboard, plus the original trip light surge protector independently. And spoiler alert, he is later going to ask about a ground loop hum. I've had that happen <laughs> <laughs> from his subwoofers. But that aside for now. Uh, he, here's his first question. He could use uh, a battery backup for his modem and networking gear. Anything from trip light that we might suggest? And yes. So I can't claim to be as familiar with trip lights lineup of um, power protection right. products as I am with APCs. Uh, so this is me searching through their website and taking my best educated guess after having looked through that. Uh, so just the caveat that there is every possibility there is a product in Trip Lights lineup that I am simply unaware of or overlooked. There might be models in uh, Trip Lights catalog that uh, that would be a better solution. However, uh, looking at what they call their Smart Pro LCD um, series of battery backup units, those have all the features that I I would be looking for uh, mm. for what he's requesting in particular for something like your modem and networking gear where uh, I mean of course you might want longer and longer battery life depending on how long blackouts and brownouts happen in your area but mm. you know typically you don't need a tremendous amount of wattage coming from the battery and not a huge number of battery protected outlets so I would point to their smart 1000 LCD model which has an MSRP of $190 but you can definitely find it online uh, for, for less than that that's just the MSRP now that has eight outlets four of which are battery protected and mm -hmm. should, according to their runtime chart, uh, with, you know, like a modem and a router plugged into it, give you, you know, on about 45 minutes of battery life, which is often enough if you just have short blackouts going on. Also on this model, it does have coaxial in and out. So if you've got, you know, cable internet service, you can have the surge protection on that part of things too. So And I that's think... really important because I, I know for a fact we got zapped in the past right. and it wasn't about coming through the power system. That's right. It came through the cable television. That's so right. So any electric connection that you have to the outside world uh you would be surprised how a, a power surge can bounce through things for sure i've had it go go into one piece of equipment and then bounce through an hdmi cable yep. and then kill Absolutely. an hdmi output yep. on a receiver <laughs> hdmi outputs are so sensitive but i've had it come in from the cable kill a cable modem and then bounce through the house to another piece of equipment yeah, yeah. and it goes all over the place so it isn't just it may not be your trip light but it may be that's right yeah so uh uh, yeah, to me, that uh, Smart 1000 LCD, $190 MSRP for networking gear, I think that one's a good solution. Right. And also just brings up how happy I am that we have fiber now. That's mm. one less electrical connection right. from the outside world. Yeah. Because it's just a little tiny hair plastic cable <laughs> inside some shielding. It's amazing. Uh, 
more questions. Uh, he could also use something to protect his gaming systems. He'd like it to have voltage regulation and ideally a form factor like the old APC H15 or J15. Any suggestions from TripLight's lineup? So as I said, I'm sticking with that Smart Pro LCD sure. series of battery backups. Uh, this one going to the top of the line, uh, the Smart 1500 LCD. Uh, the numbers do uh, refer to how many uh, watts or at least volt amps uh, the batteries are set to produce. So 1,000 from the Smart 1000 LCD, 1,500 from the Smart 1500 LCD. Uh, this does have uh, the form factor. In fact, it comes with uh, ra optional rack ears. You can take those off. So this can be rack mounted. Uh, this can just sit horizontally and look very much like a regular piece of gear. MSRP on this one is $330. So, you know, you're spending a bit, but that's not way out of line with APC's prices either. It's a little bit higher, but I, like I say, that's MSRP. So you can usually find them for a little bit less if you're shopping online. Um, this one is also providing eight electrical outlets, but all of them are battery backup on the Smart nice. 1500 LCDs. So when we're talking about protecting a bunch of game systems, you have a blackout, you're in the middle of a game, but it gives you enough battery time to save your game, shut everything down safely. Right. That's, that's the type of thing we're looking to do. Uh, this isn't going to keep your whole home theater running for two hours and watch a movie while you've got a blackout. That's not the no. point. You know, you're going to get 20, 30 minutes with your whole home theater on, but that should be enough time to save your game, shut down safely. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable solution and a pretty reasonable price in about $300 or so. The Smart 1500 LCD. Right. I anything that gives you time to shut it down is an adequate amount of, of power. Uh, more questions. Do those little two outlet units that plug right into the wall without a cord actually do anything worthwhile? <laughs> He's got a Roku TV in the bedroom with nothing else connected to it. Would one of those two outlet surge protectors be worthwhile or will his whole house surge protection make it redundant and unnecessary? You know, as weird as power surges are, mm -hmm. I it, it doesn't, I wouldn't say it's useless. I, it no, could do something. I mean, the, the, people who, do something. the people who install those whole house surge protectors, they always say this doesn't replace your outlet surge protectors mm -hmm. that, you know, plug directly into the device. Like, they're like, no, you still have your surge protectors on all your outlets as normal. This is just a little bit of additional protection at the panel itself. Hopefully, you know, this surge protector sacrifices itself rather than a lightning strike or a surge getting through all of the equipment in your house. So uh, it, it's not a matter of redundancy in this case being a bad thing. We're perfectly right. fine having an additional surge protector on the actual outlet that the TV plugs into. Those little two outlet surge protectors, uh, you know, they're just a MOV, a metal oxide varistor that's in there. Uh, I've never seen one that lets through more than 12 amps. The ones from Chip Light, I believe, are rated for 10 amps. But if all you have is a single TV plugged into it, that's going to be perfectly fine. You know, I wouldn't mm -hmm. go plugging your high-powered amplifier or subwoofer into one of those units, but for a regular LCD television, it's going to be perfect perfectly fine uh, doing just that. I don't have any problem with it. It's, you know, it's just self-sacrificial. If a surge happens to come right, through that right. particular wall outlet, that MOV is going to sacrifice itself, but that might save your television. So if you're getting stuff for free from Trip Light anyway, I've got zero beef just throwing one oh, yeah. of those on there. It's certainly not going to do any harm in this case. Right. I don't overspend because, of course, if lightning is going to hit your house or right next right. to your house, there's nothing you can do about it. So don't overspend to protect everything. Yeah. You can't protect everything perfectly. But, yeah, if you're getting some stuff for free or next to nothing, that's perfectly fine. Um, he's got two rhythmic FV15 HP subwoofers connected to his Denon X3600H via an RCA Y splitter. He also has 12 volt triggers going to the subs also via a Y splitter from his Denon. He gets a hum. The hum does seem to get louder and quieter sometimes. When his dishwasher on another floor runs, the subs definitely hum. Mm. And his geothermal heat pump seems to be another culprit. Other appliances in his house don't seem to have any effect on the hum coming from his subs. So should he connect an isolation transformer or a ground loop isolator? Or is this something he should call an electrician about? Uh, yes to all that, probably. I mean, that is... <laughs> That, that's definitely a, something isn't grounded right if you're hearing. Well, um, uh, that is really equipment. the key. You know, if if when your, uh, you know, your heat pump or your dishwasher kicks on and your AV gear starts humming, 
the the wiring mm. the grounding of some part of your house is not right that you should call an electrician about Absolutely. they should trace that they should run all of your grounding from every electrical outlet and device in your home all to the they usually just do it by running it to a new ground post that they sync themselves so that they know it's done correctly but i mean that that really is what should be done here something like a ground loop isolator that just sits on you know in line with your rca cable that is the band-aid of all band-aids that is not right. fixing what is actually wrong here that is just essentially you know throwing in a bit of a line resistor in there to knock the noise down some it's 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 a band-aid absolutely not a fix i'm not really a huge fan of even using those that that's for when you're like you know trying to record something at a venue and you just got to knock that hum down right now it's not a solve for why this is happening in the first place and it would be much better to solve why this is happening a full-on isolation transformer i mean if it were a case where for some reason there's just only one outlet in your house that ever has this problem like that's where an isolation transformer could potentially make sense mm. but the they're not cheap isolation transformers are not cheap and again it's not really fixing the problem at the root it's just like it is a potential fix like i say if you have one outlet in your house that's a problem and nothing else is but it's like if this is happening when stuff on the upstairs floor kicks in now nah, this is a house wiring issue and my, i would put all the money towards bringing an electrician in not putting a band-aid on it right and check the whole house surge protector make sure it's uh grounded properly right could, could be there too <laughs> yeah um all right well that's a all that is very interesting i hate hums my god i mm. hate it it's it's bedeviled me for 25 <laughs> years in various situations. i mean i would just say try unplugging your 12 volt trigger because sometimes that's all it is mm, and yeah. that's that's easy enough to just unplug and find out <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Just, just gradually unplug one thing, one thing at a time. That's yeah. free, and see what might be picking up the ground loop. Moving on to Layton. Layton doesn't want his room roasted. <laughs> we're we're going to be nice, but he'd love to get our feedback based on his pictures as to whether to remove or add any room treatments in order to further improve his sound. Don't worry about the small-looking Pioneer Curl Plasma. It's being replaced with a much bigger OLED. Man, size doesn't always matter. It's okay. <laughs> We're not going to be mean. He knew someone was going to say, though, look at all this room, and that TV looks too small. But, uh, <laughs> it does. Okay, yeah, sure. just, <laughs> just to run through these, looking at his wall, he's got corner base traps. They are corner straddling base, yeah. the corners. Uh, he has what, I don't know the thickness of the absorption panels that are above his television, but he does have front wall treatments that are above his TV. So those are well above ear level, but they're up there. He has a couple of two foot by two foot diffusion panels that are directly mm -hmm. behind his front and left uh, towers. Uh, nothing behind his center as far as an acoustic treatment goes. And yeah, what's behind his speakers are, well, the corner base traps are partially, but then uh, mm -hmm. foot by two foot diffusion panels. Uh, at the back of his room, he has more straddling corner base traps. So base trapping on point. I give you on big point, thumbs absolutely. up for your base trapping. That would be the place to start. And you've done that and that all looks good. He does have absorption panels that are at ear level when he's sitting down behind his seat. So a big thumbs up from me to that as well. Then he has a couple more two foot by two foot diffusion panels that are above those absorption panels on the back wall. Um, looking at the side walls on the left, uh, his door is basically at his first reflection point and he's hung an absorption panel on that door. He's also put another one just behind the door, which would maybe be like a second reflection, like the reflection that's coming from, say, his front right speaker to his left side wall. Mm -hmm. That what might kind of be getting that. Uh, over on the right-hand side, he's sort of done the same thing in front of his windows. He's put absorption panels at the first and second reflection points over there. Um, yeah, up on his ceiling, uh, he's actually put a uh, an absorption panel that I think is more or less, if it's in front of his seats, it's not very much in front of his seats. Because looking at the other rear photo, he's got these two uh, small black panels that are at the back of the room, just above his uh, projector at the very back of the room. And then on the ceiling, he's got a white panel just in front of those. So my guess is those are almost directly above the seats. I don't think they would be mm -hmm. getting like the first reflection point on the ceiling from the front speakers. But he also has what looks like an access panel into the attic uh, at basically where the first reflection uh, towards the front of the room would be so you know doing yeah. what he can there um yeah then he's got his subwoofers uh in the front right hand corner and the rear left hand corner so my 
thought here? I mean, uh, you know, he's just saying, hey, look at these acoustic treatments. What do you think should be moved or changed if anything is done? Uh, my initial thought is that if you could get absorption lower on your front wall, uh, behind your speakers, including your center speaker, if that's at all possible. His center speaker is on an equipment stand, so I don't really see a reason why that equipment stand couldn't be full pulled just you know two or three inches forward, just enough room uh, to mm -hmm, put mm -hmm. uh, an acoustic panel on that front wall, which would end up below your television, uh, but you know uh, part of it would be covering behind that center speaker. So basically, the three absorption panels that are high up on your front wall, I would move those down and have those. Um, you know, at, at ear height below, uh, you know, behind your front three speakers, they're more likely to help you out there. Uh, the diffusion, like, I don't really know how much that is doing, to be honest, but I might just take the ones that are on the front wall right now and move them up to where the absorption of the front wall is. The back wall looks good to me. I'm a big fan of the straddling corner base traps. Your subwoofer placement is good for the amount of room that you have in this room you know it's a small room size so it's got big subs so they're they're going very, where very they good. physically fit you've done what you can on your side walls to address those first reflections uh, i don't really suspect that what you've got on your ceiling is doing much of anything <laughs> to be perfectly honest uh, but since it's, bit. since it's already yeah. up there like you know the hassle of taking it down or moving it wouldn't be worth it to me so i'm perfectly fine with that i would suspect that some people out there might come into this room and personally feel it's a little over deadened. Uh, that wouldn't shock me for some mm -hmm. people. I, looking at this room, would probably love it because I love rooms that are a little bit on the deader side of things. Uh, right. If, however, you go to the trouble of doing full RT60 measurements and maybe up in the treble, you see that you know the line is sloping down a little bit more than you would like to. You want more of a, a flatter line going all the way across all the frequencies in your RT60 decay times, and you're seeing a roll off in the high frequencies, which is a possibility, I would say, in this room. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe just removing like the panels on your side walls at the second reflection points you know that's mm. that's kind of where i would start with that i'd keep the ones at your first reflection points maybe taking that panel off the ceiling if it doesn't you know uh result in maybe he put it up there because he's got a bit of a slap echo that he noticed off the ceiling and having that panel on the ceiling gets rid of that but you know okay. maybe taking a little bit of absorption out of this room might get some of those higher frequency rt60 times to be a bit of a flatter line instead of a downward slope but if you're like me and you actually prefer a bit of a deader sounding room, you're still within Dolby's recommendations and guidelines if you have a high frequency slope coming down in those RT60 times. It's not as though you're out of recommended spec. It's just a bit of personal preference at that point. So yeah, I think you've done really, really well. And honestly, the only things I would probably suggest changing is just the placement of the front wall treatments. Yeah, I mean, without, you know, criticizing any look, <laughs> he's really got it. I mean, yeah. uh, the only thing I see that's even reflective exposed to reflections is, you know, like above the door and above the window. Sure. But that's that probably gets absorbed in some way before it bounces back down to your ears, maybe. I, so Yeah, I mean, that, I that, that is general room reverberation. I mean, one thing here, one reason why I don't think this room is overtreated, particularly not for anyone with my taste, is it does look like it's actually hard floor with just a rug over it. And he's got right, you know, a big right. couch in there. The couch is going to uh, provide you know some absorption and diffusion of its own, too, just by virtue of its mm -hmm. size and being a bit plush. But it does look at, like it's tile floor with a rug over it. So I don't think your floor is providing uh, much in the way of high frequency absorption as you know it would if it were full wall-to-wall -wall carpet so having this amount of absorption treatment on the walls you know you're still going to be around that 30 percent uh, you know total um uh, surfaces of, of all the room surfaces treated when your floor itself is not uh, carpeted at all so i think you're in good shape Right. I mean, there's not much else you can do here besides huh? have somebody stand and hold panels in different places and see what you think. <laughs> you could try that, I suppose. But no, I think he's done quite a good job of, of hitting all the high points of what you do with the absorption. Yes. Good so, job, Leighton. Good job. All right. On to Jeremy. Jeremy has updated his 13 foot wide by 11 foot long theater. It used to be painted matte black, but he changed it to a dark indigo. He swapped out his JVC RS56 projector for an Epson 5040UB a while back and also changed from a 110 inch 16 by nine screen to a 152 inch 2.35 to one Seymour AV screen. He had to put a short throw lens in front of the Epson to be able to fill the screen with his limited room length. 
So he that's a big old wide screen for, for that uh, for that depth <laughs> from the couch. That is something else. Yep. Um, Th- that's got to be on the wide end of the Dolby spec of the angle to the screen to your eyes. Well, yeah, so. I mean, from the images he showed in, it's it's in fact so wide that his front left and right speakers are somewhat in front of the left and right edges of the a screen. A little bit, so yeah. It's uh, <laughs> you kind of gone as wide as the room will allow, and not necessarily the optimal setup. But uh, yeah, this is more of letting us know what's there as opposed to uh, asking for advice about the screen. So that's fine. You that's do right. you as long as you are happy with the results. And hey, sometimes maybe those subtitles are falling down below the screen and can't be seen but you know sure. that's that's <laughs> what you've decided this is someone who has enjoyed sitting in the front row at the theater that's right i think so uh this room also serves as the demo room for the waterloo three-way tower speakers that jeremy makes and sells through his company jporterstudios.com whoops free little plug there for that's his, right uh, for his <laughs> studio um first up he'd like to upgrade the projector again He's strongly considering the new Epson LS12000 that goes for $5,000. It's got the brightness to handle his screen size and his eyes, too, <laughs> which he intends to keep. Do you intend to keep your eyes? Uh, and the lens memory to work nicely with his 2.35 to 1 setup. It should also continue to work with his existing short throw lens. But he's also always liked Sony's motion processing and the higher contrast of LCOS projectors. So... Should he go with the $6,000 Sony XW5000ES instead? There's an interesting question. So what do we want to blind him with, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I have a bit of trouble getting behind that XW5000ES. I mean, he already alluded to it doesn't have any motorized lens features the way that the less expensive Epson does. And when you're doing a constant image height setup, sometimes it's pretty nice to have that motorized lens so that we know when you watch 1.85 to 1 content or 16 by 9 content on your cinemascope screen you can zoom the projector back so that you know the height actually fits within the height of the screen that mm. you have rather right. than there being part of the image projected above and below your cinemascope screen so in this type of setup i find that motorized lens pretty darn important mm -hmm. uh, also being able to keep the exact same short throw lens that you've already paid for and just putting it in front of the epson lens that might be reason enough honestly uh that that i would lean that way but furthermore you know the xw 5000 es it does not do 4k 120 uh the epson ls 12000 does so if you've got the new mm -hmm. gaming systems or a high-end pc and you mm -hmm. want to be able to do some 4k 120 uh content on that sony can't do that uh it is dimmer and you've got this gigantic screen so i'm like i'm totaling it all up you're paying a thousand dollars more to take a step back on a whole bunch of features just to get the liquid crystal on silicon which admittedly natively does have better black levels and contrast but it's not as though the epson ultra black it's lcd panels but it's not as though it's a slouch and you are saving a thousand dollars and then getting i mean to me that motorized lens is really important so honestly my take on this is that if you were going to go for liquid crystal on silicon and pay more money than the epson i would go to a jvc i'd go to the jvc np5 it goes for $7,000. You know, it's $1,000 more than the Sony. It's $2,000 more than the Epson. But if you want all the things, the JVC NP5 gives you the motorized lens. It gives you the best black levels out of all three of these, the best contrast out of all three of these. Mm. I'm wondering if he's hesitating because the NP5 is a traditional lamp and not a laser. Both the Sony XW5000 and the Epson LS12000 are laser light sources. Uh, the NP5 is a lamp, but as Tom and I have often said, we're like, we're, we're kind of still leaning towards using lamps just because the lasers, once once they dim, that's it. You're getting a whole new projector. <laughs> there's there's that's at this true. point no replacing the laser light engines. Yeah, they're supposed to last 20,000 hours. But if you use this thing like a television, you know, eight hours a day or something like that, that goes pretty quick. So to me, if you're going to spend more, I'd spend $2,000 more and get the JVC NP5. All right, so either 5000 for the Epson LS12000 or 7000 for that NP5 That's from right. JVC. And oh, honestly, I'm kind of leaning towards going with that LS12000 just because you can use the exact same short throw lens and you know it's going to physically fit and yeah. the lens is going to work. 
Yeah, you don't want price creep in a situation like this. You already have an option that slots right in to what you have yeah. and what you're expecting. Uh, he'd like to acoustically treat this room, particularly since it's serving as the demo room for his own Jay Porter Studios Waterloo speakers. At the moment, the only treatments are a pair of two-inch thick two-by-four panels, two feet by four feet panels, on either side of the window on the left side wall. He's got six Two by four pieces of Owens Corning four inch thick insulation ready to go to make more panels. Where should they be placed? So it, this is interesting because this is shifted 90 degrees over on the side of the room. Is that am I seeing that correct? Uh, when he was uh, demoing his uh, Waterloo demoing speakers, it. yeah, he had uh -huh. put them in front of the window and uh, rotated everything 90 degrees. But um, yeah, using this as the theater setup um yeah just below that there was a little bit more text there uh scrolling down sure. if you want to cover that yeah he was thinking he'd put a couple on the back wall and then the rest on the angled ceiling on the back and left side walls but should he reserve a panel or two for the right side wall directly beside the projection screen so i would say absolutely yes uh, mm -hmm. I would definitely want to have. Now, what I might suggest doing here, honestly, is uh, take the rear two inch thick panel that's beside the window. So the one that's closer to the back of the room, put that on the right side of the screen. So you've got two inch thick panels to the left and right of the screen. Um, I think that would be the way to go there. I definitely want you to have panels on the back wall because the seats in this setup are pushed right against the back wall. So I would mm -hmm. prioritize that. And then the remaining four inch thick panels i'm assuming you're going to have three or four left over certainly having those in the angled parts of the ceiling is going to be fine that's going to be just overall room reverberation cutting down on that a little bit of base trapping it's going to provide as well um maybe in the rear corners of the room straddle the rear corners of the room uh if you want to do that or or have more panels that come in the future so that's what i would focus on i would definitely focus on the back uh, of uh the wall and i don't want to have like it's it, the way he said it in his email it sounded like everything that wasn't on the back wall was on the left side of the room. And that doesn't make mm. sense to me. No, you want to have in this setup some symmetry. It's not as though the right-hand wall is just completely open to avoid. Right. So uh, I would definitely put some, whatever you do on the left, I would sort of symmetrically do on the right. I always picture zillions of billiard balls coming out of a speaker and bouncing off various yeah. surfaces. Picture those angles and to know where to first put something to first try. But yeah, uh, shall we move on to Mike's questions? Let's shell. All right, Mike has a new gas fireplace being installed. It's a flush in-wall design with no mantle. He'll have his LED backlit LCD TV mounted about a foot above the top of the fireplace just on a normal TV wall mount. Should he be concerned about the heat? Would installing a mantle or a wood shelf above the fireplace and below the TV be an effective heat shield and worth the cost? I mean, my first instinct is, yeah, that's a little something, you know, it is going to come out of that and come straight up to some extent. I, you know, if there's enough space between the TV and, and the wall, mm -hmm. maybe that's not a problem. Or if you just had a little quiet fan back there to circulate the air through, maybe that would be OK. But it does concern me. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, I mean, Tom and I are never fans of putting a tv above a wood burning fireplace we'd, we'd try to mm -hmm. sort of avoid that at all costs if possible particulates the, yeah i mean above an electric fireplace is the best if you've got to do it um mm -hmm. uh, usually you don't have too much of a an actual chimney flu type situation where there's heat being directed straight upwards gas fireplaces kind of fall in the middle right they're not right. the wood burning fireplace where there's you know tons of heat and even some particulate coming out mm -hmm. front of the fireplace uh, you're not going to have that with the gas fireplace but you do have heat being directed directly upward um so i mean it's it's not the recommendation to mount your tv above that type of thing of course you see oodles of people who do that would i go to the expense of like having a mantle or a wood shelf installed when that wasn't the initial plan i mean like likely says it's like it's a it's a, it's a little bit of something it kind of breaks up the airflow but mm -hmm. like my honest honest take on this is i don't know i don't know for sure um you know uh i, I would contact the tv manufacturer who's probably just going to say something as simple as we don't recommend doing this uh, right so that's all they're going to tell you that's yeah. going to be a pretty short call this is one where it's a bit outside of my purview like if you w what i'm reticent to say is you know talk to a, an installer who installs tvs all the time because they're going to say yeah sure of course we can do this because they they do it all the time mm -hmm. and if something goes wrong with your tv they're assuming you're going to call them and that's another <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, like surface right. golf. <laughs> I'm, I'm not really confident that you're necessarily going to get the best safety information. Um, if you contact the fireplace manufacturer, I'm probably sure they're going to say, we don't recommend doing this. So it's like, it, it's a bit up a creek with this one because I'm not sure who to point you to to get really good information on this you know something that isn't either yeah. self-serving or just cover your butt <laughs> advice i feel um, like like something i would just do as a little smarty pants here that i am just thinking i know how everything works i would <laughs> find a a quiet fan that was powered mm, by usb that tv is going to have right, a usb port right so find a quiet fan that's powered by usb and put it behind the tv aiming down that's what hmm. i would do I mean, I, I might even that would... aim them up just to get the air going, right? Because, I mean, well, you can't fight the heat. The heat's going to rise. But then you're pulling the heat up behind the TV, whereas if you you're are. pointing down, you can push cooler air mm. down. I mean, I'd and rather just would... get that, that air moving. <laughs> well, or or try it Rob's way, then try it my way sure. with a temperature <laughs> yeah, sensor of some sort. Take yeah. the yeah. temperature back there, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm afraid I, I, I would like to give you a more solid do exactly this answer, but mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable giving that advice. I, I, I'm doing a bit of the cover my butt advice and saying, I know this isn't recommended. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe talk to a few different installers. I mean, this is the type of question you can just email or talk on the phone about without it necessarily costing you anything um, right. and see what sort of advice you can get. Cause I'm, I don't feel comfortable giving you a really solid do exactly this type of response on this one. But I feel like it needs something. I would hesitate um, to just put a TV right over a gas, a gas fireplace. fireplace. Yeah. yeah. I, I would not like that. Uh, Mike says that at heart, he's a two channel guy, but he still likes to have a surround sound set up even for the system that he uses mostly for music listening. He bought a pair of Salk Sounds new B Pure 2 towers. They use new Purify woofers and a Satori Beryllium tweeter. They sell for $6,500 a pair, but Mike traded in his older Salk speakers and got a substantial discount that way. He thinks they sound fantastic, and he's happy with them for two channel. Excellent. But he'd like to have a center, sure. And the Salk B-Pure only comes as towers, so he figures he has three options. Buy a third B-Pure 2 tower. Obviously, it would be a perfect match, but it would be expensive. And if he were ever to sell these speakers, he isn't sure how many people would be looking for three <laughs> or just one tower. Mm. Uh, Jim Salk mentioned on Salk's forum that he's considering using a smaller 4.5-inch Purify woofer to make a stand-mount B-Pure model that could serve as a center. However, he has warned that its maximum output would be about 103 decibels, so Mike isn't sure he'd want a smaller center that couldn't completely keep up with his towers. He could get some other center from a different brand, but how critical is it to have a perfect timbre match? And... Could it be achieved using a different brand of center? Uh, Salk's own center speaker models that use the same beryllium tweeter are huge <laughs> and cost even more than a single B-Pure tower. So he isn't keen to do that. He'd rather the center cost less. What do we suggest? My first go-to thought is a smaller version of, of whatever your tower speakers are right. that has the same tweeter. Yeah. I guess it's those higher frequencies uh, they're going to come out of the tweeter yeah. mid-range to higher frequencies where you're going to hear any timbre differences. So that's that's my first instinct. So that sounds good to me. Yeah, and at, as but, mentioned, Salk Sound, they do have two different center speaker models that do use that same beryllium tweeter, but they're $4,500 and $5,500, which is more than just buying a single B-Pure tower. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I do, if there is anywhere I want as close to a perfect timbre match as possible, it's across my front three speakers. Sure. I'm very willing to accept a small timbre mismatch in my surrounds. I'm very willing to accept a timbre mismatch in my surround backs and overhead speakers. Mm -hmm. But across my front three, left, center, right, I do want as close to a perfect timbre match as I can get. For right. that reason, the safest advice I can give here is get the third tower uh, mm. but of course that is you know costing a bit more than he was hoping for i'm not worried about you know thinking of the future and selling these on and having three of these towers or selling two of them as a pair and then having a single left over it's remarkable how many times somebody is looking for the single um so I, i'm not 
super worried that that's the reason to avoid it. It would mainly just be that it's the price. And of course, you're using a, a tower as your center. I don't know whether he's got a TV mounted up quite high or if it's an acoustically transparent screen up front and a tower mm. would be no problem. But, you know, if you are worried about perfect timbre match, that's the way to do it. Um, I'm not going to tell you wait for a speaker that literally doesn't exist yet. You yeah, know, that's, uh, tough. that's something that, that Jim Salk has, has toyed with. Um, like I say, they already have two matching center speaker models they're just bigger and more expensive <laughs> so um you know making the small litter essentially monitor version of it I, I think there's a high likelihood he probably will make a monitor version of it and at that time you could definitely try it out as a center but i'm not going to say you know that that that's the thing to do is wait for a speaker that literally doesn't exist so that leaves option three and i mean looking around if if you just go by center speaker models that are out there that use beryllium tweeters because that's sort of the starting okay. point that we look at it's not an identical beryllium tweeter but at least beryllium for beryllium you know you're looking at focal but their least expensive center that uses a beryllium tweeter is the sopra center and that goes for four uh no that's the canta is the least expensive that goes for four thousand dollars the sopra goes for five thousand ah. dollars and then they have you know their uh their utopia which is in a price that isn't even listed anywhere online because if you have to ask you can't afford it so you know four thousand dollars is more than getting a third tower uh right. per, per listen of course their smallest beryllium tweeter speaker center is the s5c that goes for six thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> And then Revel Ouch. has their has their Performa BE series, uh, and so they have a beryllium tweeter version of the center speaker from the Performa BE series from Revel, but that's also five thousand dollars. So basically, all Ooh. of the center speakers that are out there to buy that use beryllium tweeters are more expensive than getting the third tower. Uh, that means I'd be looking at something like if you just look at the 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 uh, measurements that Jim Salk has taken of these B pure towers. I mean, they are ruler flat, ruler, ruler flat mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for something that delivers similarly ruler flat response, but costs less, doesn't use a beryllium tweeter, but you know, is something that I would strongly suspect. I haven't heard these B pure towers. I certainly haven't heard them used together with any of these center speakers that I'm talking about. I don't have right. that firsthand experience, but Revel would be a brand I would point you at. Uh, Revel's regular Performa 3 series, not the Performa BE with the Beryllium Tutor, but their regular Performa 3 series and their C208 center, which you can find for 1540 right now uh, over at Crutchfield. They've got it on sale. Normally goes for $2,200. But in, in either case, finally, we have a center speaker that costs less. And at right. least the measured frequency response of just being ruler flat across the board is really well matched. So if you were going to go for a less expensive center from a different brand and at least have a decent shot at a pretty good timbre match, that's what I'd be looking for. Am I expecting it to be a perfect timbre match? No, but I'm expecting it to be a lot closer than, you know, like a lot more similar versus different. Um, so that Revel mm -hmm. Performa 3 center is one I would certainly consider. Um, I might also look at Kef's R series. It's $1,300 for their R2C center. And if you just need the form factor, because like this is the one that will have the least physical height to it because it's using Kef's coaxial uh you know, driver design, where the tweeter right. is embedded right in the middle of the mid-range driver. So physically, if you just need the shorter height, that's one I might consider, but I wouldn't really anticipate the timbre match to be really, really flawless across the three speakers. I, I think the Revel Performa 3 Center has a much better shot of the timbre being much more similar than different. So that's where I point you. But honestly, I think your best solution here, if you're willing to spend the money, is just to get the third tower. I for perfection yes but he did mention that the, the using this as a as a movie theater is this is the second use his that's right he's a two channel guy right yeah. so uh what i would do if i were him as much as i'd love to spend all of mike's money uh, i would see if i could order and return at no cost one of these things from crutchfield sure or, or revel... just find another revel dealer that you know is a showroom where maybe you can bring yeah. your speakers to them if they won't bring the you know let you take the center home you could bring right. your towers to their showroom and maybe try it out that way because you're going to have some room correction some eq correction yep. on that center channel and the and center maybe always makes... sounds a little bit different just by virtue of its placement and by virtue of the fact of what gets mixed into the center mm -hmm. so honestly i think he would enjoy movies with one of these less expensive smaller options i yeah. think yeah uh, because two channel is his focus so uh, i would try the uh, cheaper 
uh, smaller speaker from someplace like Revel first. Yeah, fifteen fifty being another... cheaper, but you know, I mean it is <laughs> cheaper. Yeah, well, it's cheaper relative to what he's talking That's right. about, right? So yeah, I mean I like spending other people's money, but I also mm-hmm. like you know getting things just right. <laughs> All right, so Vasanth in India has questions, and I hope I am saying your name correctly. Uh, Vasanth is an electrical engineer and also a home theater enthusiast. He says he found our podcast about six months ago, and he's already listened back to about 100 episodes. My goodness. He likes our approach. 100 episodes. He's listened to, like, what? that's probably 300 hours of (laughs) A.B. Rett. He might have heard me a time or two in that. Uh, At the moment, He's got a 7.1 speaker system along with an Epson 5030UB with 120-inch Elite Screens projection screen, Wharfdale speakers all around except for the surround backs, which are Polk, and a Polk PSW110 subwoofer. He's been using a Yamaha RXV673 7.1 receiver, and now he'd like to make some upgrades. He'd like to stick with Epson, and he likes their three LCD projectors, he likes the value of the 6050 UB now that the new LS12000 has been released. So, any reason we'd warn him away from upgrading to an Epson 6050 UB? So, how big a jump is it from a 5030 UB to a 6050 UB? Uh, I mean, substantial, because that yeah. is 4K and HDR, and the 5030 mm. UB was not. <laughs> so, go. honestly, the, the only reason I would tell you to... Uh, not get the 6050 UB is if you are a high-end gamer and you want 4K 120 because the 6050 UB will take a 4K signal, it'll take an HDR signal, but only up to 60 frames per second. It won't do 4K at 120 frames per second, whereas the LS12000 will do 4K at 120 frames per second. So if Mm -hmm. you're the high-end gamer who wants 120 frames per second for your games, that would be the reason. Otherwise, if we're talking about movie performance, that 6050 UB is a fantastic choice, and I would happily give that a thumbs up. All right, that's that's a straightforward answer. He doesn't have any intention of replacing any of his existing speakers, but he's interested in getting a new AV receiver and expanding to an Atmos setup. If he gets a Denon X3700H, would he be able to use his current Yamaha RX V673 as the additional amplifier so that he could power a full 11 speaker configuration? I would think so. Absolutely. There is no, no problem doing that whatsoever. You can uh, use your Yamaha receiver that you have right now just as a dumb two-channel amplifier. That's what yeah. it'll end up being turned into. Uh, and I will also say, in your instance, there's not really any reason to uh, spend more money to get the brand new X3800H uh, if you get that 6050 UB. You don't need HDMI 2.1 switching if you've got a 6050 UB that that uses HDMI 2.0 anyway. Um, You know, the whole thing with the uh, four subwoofer outputs might be about the only reason. We're not going to say Dirac is a reason to do it because it isn't there yet. And we have no idea how long it's actually going to be. So I think the X3700H is a really nice partner if you go with the 6050 UB. And you can definitely use your Yamaha as a two-channel amp. There you go. His Wharfdale front speakers can be bi-amped, and his Yamaha can be set to power the front left and right speakers in bi-amp mode. So could he send the front left-right signal from the pre-outs of the Denon into his Yamaha and bi-amp his front speakers that way? I believe he could. I think I've asked you, Rob, about Mm -hmm. the the utility uh, uh, and the necessity or not of bi-amping. What kind of difference I would see, because my speakers, my tower speakers from Yamaha could do that Mm -hmm. from my Yamaha receiver. Uh, So he says, if so, what would be the connection path? How would he control the volume level across both receivers? And how would he calibrate using Odyssey in the Denon? Yeah, so straight up, you you could physically do this. Uh, I will say, I don't think there is any utility in your setup of actually doing the bi-amp setup. Um, Having a amplifier that is dedicated to just the tweeter of your speaker that yeah. uses very little power, um, you know, in comparison to how much power gets diverted <laughs> to the woofers, like it's, this isn't going to be any sort of big difference. Uh, so I would suggest your connection path simply being taking the left and right pre-outs from the Denon, 
uh, putting that into any regular RCA left and right input, you know, the CD input of your Yamaha, right, right. Uh, setting up your Yamaha just as a stereo receiver, just telling it that all it has is two speakers. Mm. Don't run any YPOW. Set right. the levels and distances to the default zero. You know, in fact, just do a full factory reset of your Yamaha when you, once you've got the Denon, and then just manually set up as a two channel. That's all you've got uh, in the Yamaha. Uh, that would be the connection path. I would just use regular stereo input, CD input on the Yamaha, and just connect the front left and right speakers to the front left and right binding posts of the Yamaha and not worry about biamping at all. But if you really want to do this, you would simply, in the Yamaha's manual setup, set it to its biamp mode. There's only the option to biamp the front left and right speakers. Then you would do the way the Yamaha does its biamping, which is taking the surround back binding posts and using those as the second outputs uh, for each speaker. And that's all you have to do. Uh, the volume is going to be controlled by the Denon. You want to turn your Yamaha's volume dial, master volume dial, to some pre-selected setting. You know, leaving it at the full zero dB means you're getting the full gain capabilities of the Yamaha. So if you can turn that Yamaha uh, master volume dial to zero dB and not get uh, an audible noise floor when everything's just sitting idle, you know, turned on but not playing any anything, if you have no noise floor with the Yamaha set to zero dB, you just put the master volume dial there and you leave it and you never ever touch it ever again. Uh, that's just where it goes. Uh, once you have the pre-outs going from the Denon into the Yamaha's CD input, you just run Odyssey as normal, and the Denon's Odyssey program will take care of setting the levels and distances and is just using that Yamaha as a dumb amplifier, as though the Yamaha had no settings of its own. Uh, it's just a dumb amplifier at that point with its master volume in a fixed position that you never, ever touch again. But is there any real audio advantage to using the Yamaha for the front left and right rather than just using the Denon's front left oh, and right. Oh, not in particular. You, you could also no, use the Yamaha so. just to power your rear heights. <laughs> that, That's that what be, I would do. I that would just would be use fine the, There's no, it's not like the Yamaha's amps are, you know, somehow substantially better at driving those Wharfdale no, front but, left and right. But at the same time, you are going to have that Denon powering nine out of 11 speakers, no matter what you mm -hmm. do. And certainly the front left and right speakers are going to have more signal content going to them than your rear heights. So sure. offloading the amplifier duties of your front left and right speakers is giving your Denon a little bit more of a break than offloading the rear height duties. So mm -hmm. I don't mind using your Yamaha receiver to power your front left rights at all. And if he wants to try the biamp experiment it's easy enough you just manually set the yamaha to say i just have stereo speakers right i don't have a sub i don't have any other speakers just stereo speakers but i have them in biamp mode and that's all you need to do that's right but be careful if you do that biamp mode that you don't fall prey to those uh, subjective mental effects you know <laughs> what i mean where you think you hear a difference well i mean if he does what's you the want harm? to so <laughs> oh yeah i mean it isn't hurting anything no. but it's just a lot of effort i don't know i'm lazy all right <laughs> let's move on to some actual new questions right <laughs> as we approach the end of the podcast <laughs> so new for this week from alan Alan has a question about Bluetooth earbuds. Which Bluetooth earbud style earphones would we recommend for working out? Uh, none of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> everything falls out of my ears. Ah. Uh, Alan prefers foam inserts, and it's critical they do not fall out. Yeah. He wants them for going to the gym and maybe doing chores around the house. Under $75 if possible. Fidelity isn't really all that high on the priority list, but he's been using a pair of $27 Senso earphones that somewhat frequently drop their signal. So he'd like a big improvement on that front, and a bit better quality sound than those would be nice too. So what are we into lately? I think this is something that Tom looks at a lot with... Uh, yeah, that, that would have situation. been helpful because I, I don't have the, uh, in my memory bank, uh, the full list of everything that Tom has looked at, and I'm sure he would have a suggestion, and maybe we'll be able to revisit this question. But coming from me, I would point you at uh, Anchors Soundcore Life.2 with Air Wings. That, that's the 
the full title just you know so memorable but uh yeah anchor soundcore life.2 with air wings we'll have the link uh where you can get them from amazon for 50 bucks so they have come in under the 75 dollar mark um they come with a nice array of uh different ears uh ear tip sizes as well as the uh air wing sizes which is you know just a little piece of silicon that wedges itself uh into the pinna of your ear and that's the thing that mm-hmm. holds it in there a bit more securely one of the tips i always like to mention to people is that your left and right ears can be different in their sizes That's both right. the ear canal and the pinna of your ear so you might find out that it's the smallest ear tip with the largest air wing that fits your left ear whereas it's the medium ear tip and the medium air wing that fits your right ear so definitely don't have mm. to make the left and right ears symmetrical and that seems to be something people almost always do and then they complain that one of the you know earbuds falls out of the ear all the time it's like because eh, it, your ears aren't symmetrical so right. don't be afraid to experiment with the air wing and the ear tip sizes. Um, yeah, it comes with the rechargeable case, of course. And one thing I like is that you can use it as single earbud mode. Sometimes when you're, you know, out and you want to just be able to listen to a podcast, but one ear will do you. I like that it has the feature where you can use either earbud in single earbud mode. And that works too. You don't have to always use them as a stereo pair. And it combines it to mono. It's not just the left channel or just that's the right. right channel. Yeah, it goes yeah, into an nice. actual single mode. Let me tell you, nothing irritates me more uh, than Bluetooth, earphones, earbuds, that whole world, because uh, most of it is just absolute trash. <laughs> and uh, I'm, it's just the truth. And, and I recently, well, some months ago, we, w- my wife wanted a pair and we decided, all right, we're going to figure this out. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and let me tell you, the best approach we have found is that you first have to find what stays in your ears yes. above all else, above fidelity, above anything. The first thing is to find what actually stays in your ears and doesn't hurt your ears. And for my wife, it was the, um, uh, what's the Apple air. What's the, what, what do you call the yeah, AirPod, Apple earbuds, AirPod, AirPod pros. AirPods? Uh, the AirPod format was kind of like pear shaped. Yeah. It's a little, yeah. And so she didn't want something, she didn't want to have a closed up ear canal okay. with a little rubber stopper in your ear. She yeah. didn't like that, uh, the silicone. Uh, and uh, so she found that that stayed in her ear and was comfortable. Mm. So then it was just a matter of picking from that shape. We found some uh, JVCs that were. Uh, okay basically imitating the apples yeah and those stayed in her ear and they sounded uh i'm gonna give it a a solid b plus and that was as good as it got Mm. uh but i'm telling you nothing will raise my blood pressure more than trying to deal with damn bluetooth (laughs) earbuds and headphones because let me tell you the the best headphones i have that i jog with Mm -hmm. are ten dollar panasonic earphones right. from the 90s yeah and you can still order them on amazon and they're still ten dollars and the sound quality <laughs> is better than any earbud i've ever heard until you get to about a hundred dollars right but they are Honest corded God, they're corded, are corded yes yeah. so if it must be cord less mm. and, and i don't know why they can't make i guess it's because of fashion it's truly fashion yeah. because there's no reason why a little strap over your head holding them on your head Mm. i jog they don't fall off your head is shaped like a head it has you know (laughs) in other words they figured this out in the late 70s with the first walkman that the most logical obvious way to go running with headphones is to strap it over the top of your big skull (laughs) because you have a human skull and then it just squeezes against your ears but why doesn't anybody make that but bluetooth drives me insane because the next thing you can get after earbuds is big fat Pretty much. Headphones. Yep. That that almost cover your ear. That's the next step up. We just forgot about those old Walkman <laughs> headphones. They worked. People weren't <laughs> deaf in 1979. Uh, so anyway, that's a big frustration of mine. So what I, I just recommend ordering a few different ones and sending that's back true. a couple of yeah. them. But uh, I will it's... say, I, I give Anchor credit. The, uh, typically, their their Bluetooth connections are as solid as as anybody's can be. So, right. Uh, give give those ones a try. They're fifty bucks, and you can send them back to Amazon if they don't work. So there you go. Very easy, very small thing to send back. So moving on to uh, Kiran in India again. Hope I, I'm saying that. I think right. it's Kiran. Kiran. Kiran? Yeah, I think I can so. say Kiran. Uh, Kiran had his home theater set up in a 7.1 configuration, but he has ultimately decided that he doesn't actually like his surround back speaker. <laughs> hmm. I would like to know why. Uh, a lot of the time, they aren't really doing anything. Well, that happens, depending on the movie. <laughs> and then when they do, he doesn't really care for it. So he figures he'll go back to 5.1. 
as far as his floor level speakers go. He's using a Denon X3500H receiver, which tops out at seven speakers total. He'll be able to try out Atmos and DTS-X as a 5.1.2 configuration at least, mm -hmm. but he already has those surround back speakers installed. And he also wouldn't mind moving his surround and surround back speakers around a bit. He would like to know if there's a way to duplicate the surround channels to play out of both the surrounds and the surround backs. And he'd also like to know if it would be better to have two pairs of side surround speakers with one pair a little in front of the seats and the second pair a little behind the seats. Bottom line, would he hear any improvement from having four surround speakers? And if so, how do they all get hooked up to his receiver? Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, but the recommendation from Dolby is that they be off to the sides of your head or slightly behind. Yeah, I mean, that not is... not in front of. Yeah, certainly um, where we typically recommend having more than one pair of surround speakers to the side of you is when you have more than one row of seats. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not actually sure if Kiran right. has more than one row of seats in his theater, but if it's just a single row of seats or only one row of seats that you really care about, uh, then I wouldn't recommend using more than one pair of side surround speakers. And I would have them basically straight to your sides and then just a little bit back, a little bit behind you. And probably mm. elevate it a little bit so that they have a clear line of sight and nobody's mm. head is going to be blocking the sound to anybody else who's sitting across the couch. Um, so that's the general advice. But mm -hmm. since the speakers are already installed and the speaker wire is already run, you can definitely just try this out. Because there is a way to have two pairs of speakers playing the same signal. Uh, you're going to want to wire them in series. Right. And the way that you would do that in this case is let's just talk about the left side of the room. So you're going to take the uh, black lead from the surround back left speaker. All right. Okay. And you're yeah. going to plug that into the black binding post of the surround output on your uh, AV receiver. Right. So mm -hmm. you've got black going to black, but instead of the black binding post of the surround of your AV receiver going to the black input of your surround speaker, it's going to be going to the black input of your surround back speaker. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now you're going to take the red connection of your surround speaker, not your surround back speaker, the red connection of your surround speaker, and plug that into the red binding post of your AV receiver. All right. Mm -hmm. So you've got the black connection from your AV receiver going to the surround back, but the red connection of your AV receiver going to the surround. Okay. Now, of course, you're saying that leaves the red connection from my surround back speaker and the black connection of my surround speaker. Those yes, two connect them. Those two aren't plugged into anything yet. They get twisted together. <laughs> right. Those two get twisted together. So you don't have to move your speaker wire at all. You don't have to move your speakers physically just to give this a try. What you have done by wiring things that way is created a series circuit, right? If you imagine that a line comes out of the black binding post of the AV receiver, it'll go into the black of the surround back speaker, out of the red of the surround back speaker. That's going to come all the way down that speaker wire and then connect to the black of the surround speaker, go into the surround speaker and come out the red of the surround speaker back to the red binding post of the AV receiver, a series right. circuit. And you didn't have to physically move anything besides twisting together the black surround back and the red of the, or uh, sorry, the uh, red of the surround back and the black of the surround, and then changing the binding posts a little bit. Mm. So that's how you would connect things in series. You can give it a try. I don't anticipate you liking the results of having the surround speakers duplicated out of your surround backs. If you already don't like the results when the surround backs just play the surround back channel in a 7.1 piece of content, mm -hmm. if you're finding that distracting because it's too close to your head behind you it's still going to be there um and if you just have the one row of seats i wouldn't bother with two pairs of side surround speakers yeah i wish i knew more about what he didn't like about the results right. of what he was getting yeah uh, it sounds like just uh, it's, it sounds as though he's wishing more came out of the speakers to for that more but was then happening. he says when it does he doesn't like the way it sounds so right. <laughs> he's like <laughs> a it barely gets used and B when it does get used, I don't like it. So there you go. To That's me, a good argument to stop using it. Yeah. To me, you could take that pair of surround back speakers and use them in a different room or use them as your heights. If you don't already have another pair of speakers that could be used as heights and you can do that is what I'm thinking. 
implement them as Atmos speakers yep. up high. That's that, right. That's, that's probably the best result for him if he tries that. Yeah. But your series wiring experiment is free and not terribly that's difficult right. yeah. if it's done correctly. Uh, so he can always try that first yep. and see what he thinks just for fun. And then maybe it's time to move those surround back speakers into a different position. That's what I All think. All right. Ryan. First up, Ryan was able to get a second SVS SB1000 Pro subwoofer after starting out with just one. Yay. It made a much bigger improvement than he thought it would. I, there's a reason that gets suggested. <laughs> and I, I, I would have been skeptical myself, but uh, now that I have two, it's pretty neato. <laughs> Very smooth. Everywhere you sit. Perfect. Uh, now that Denon's 2022 and 23 receivers have been officially announced, he'll be looking to upgrade his Sony DN1080 receiver in the coming months. But in the meantime, he has a lip sync issue he's hoping we can help with. Ah. Ooh, me too a little bit. Ah. Ever, ever since we've gone to everything streaming uh -huh. and, and, and using YouTube TV on the, uh, uh, on, from the television, yeah. uh, I feel like the audio is always delayed by just enough for me to <laughs> notice. Just enough for me to see. Uh, he's using a Sony A80J OLED and he's gaming on an Xbox Series X. His current Sony receiver can only go up to 4K60, so if he wants the best video signal possible, he has to plug his Xbox directly into his OLED and then use EARC to send the audio to his receiver. <laughs> This works totally fine, no problems, but of course it means HDMI CEC, Sony calls it Bravia Sync, has to be turned on. The issue is with his Apple TV 4K. He mainly uses it for iTunes and Disney+. Plus. No connection method has allowed him to have good lip sync, which seems strange since his Xbox Series X is fine. <laughs> if he connects the Apple TV directly to his OLED with match frame rate off, that's as good as it gets, but it's still not perfect. Turning match frame rate on makes it much worse, practically unwatchable. If he plugs the Apple TV into his Sony receiver, having match frame rate off falls in between. And plugged into the receiver with match frame rate on is the worst, completely unwatchable. <laughs> so any ideas what setting he could change or what connection path he could use to get the audio and video properly synchronized. And I am listening to your suggestions here, Rob, because I have a lip sync issue. Not ah. as dramatic as what uh, what he is talking about, what Ryan has. But I have that little lip sync where uh -huh. the video's always ever so slightly ahead. I can see those lips and that tongue moving <laughs> just before the sound happens. <laughs> well my wife uh, can't always see it, but I, I what I'm it. what I'm gonna suggest um, for Ryan here is not gonna apply to Lee because right. you two, two have different, different televisions. He's got a Sony OLED, you've got an LG OLED. Mm -hmm. So in the case of uh, Ryan's Sony OLED, uh, he, he sent along just images of what he's done with his HDMI connections. And I'm going to strongly suggest not using Dolby Vision on your Sony OLED. Uh, mm. The A80Js had all kinds of issues with Dolby Vision implementation. And just leaving the Sony OLED on the enhanced format for your HDMI setting, don't go to enhanced format Dolby Vision, don't go to enhanced format VRR both of which were added via firmware updates after the fact and have mm. issues. Just okay. the regular enhanced format, which means you won't be able to use Dolby Vision from your Apple TV 4K. But I'm not worried about it because your Sony OLED does a fantastic job of tone mapping regular HDR10. So on the video front, you're not giving up anything as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. And on the audio front, my hope is that because that Dolby Vision implementation has had all kinds of issues. And that seems to be sort of what the problem is here. Like he's he's saying, you know, plugging it in through the OLED, having frame rate off, like it gets kind of close, but not as good in any other connection method. Like it all just gets messed up. But his Xbox is fine. Right. You know, so I'm like, yes, the Xbox has a Dolby Vision setting too, but um, the way that the Apple TV 4K does it is it's through this 8-bit tunneling method that, you know, some displays have had all kinds of issues with. So... My advice is turn off Dolby Vision in the Sony OLED and turn it off in the Apple TV 4K and see if that fixes it. Because if it's as simple as that, well, then that was a pretty easy fix. And I'm not worried about the sacrifice of not seeing Dolby Vision light up whatsoever. Um, right. Now, in your case, Lee, wh what is the mm. source that you're dealing with? Is it the built-in apps or is it 
an external It's source. all the built-in apps. It's the built-in apps. Okay. Because... In fact, we're pretty much never watching anything other than the built-in apps on the TV. Okay. And it is worse on YouTube TV. Yeah. And again, this is all subtle. Like yeah. most people aren't going to notice it at all. And for a while there, it was worse on YouTube TV on broadcast channels. Like yeah. the local broadcast channels were the worst. Then everything else was a little bit better. And then other apps like YouTube, mm, about yeah. the same little now bit better. Now, is this a but case it's... where what you need is for the audio to, to be delayed a bit more so that it no, matches the lips? The opposite. The, opposite. The, the, okay. the video is slightly ahead of the audio. Yeah, so you need the, the audio time. to come out a little bit sooner. In the yeah. LG OLEDs, there actually is in the audio settings an option to move the audio output ahead usually there's only audio delay in things oh. but in the lg oleds they actually do have a setting in the audio settings of the tv itself to move it ahead now it might not necessarily work via the hdmi output you might have to resort to connecting an optical connection to get well, that'd be fine i'm only 5.1 exactly anyway. I mean, 5. For, for, 2. for the built-in <laughs> for the built-in things that's mostly going to be okay so for the lgs my solution there is you actually do have the option of moving the audio ahead okay in the TV. I need to dig into the settings. Is yeah, what you're it me. is okay. there in the sound settings, uh, but like I say, it might only work via optical. Uh, but on the Sony, turning off Dolby Vision is is my hope that that's the, the quick and easy fix. Probably it makes sense because more video processing is happening, so and that it, it it's just, going to take longer. That that A80J had all kinds of problems with Dolby Vision once they added it, but via the mm -hmm. firmware update. So that's usually right. the problem. Look at that. You solved two people's problems. Just That's then. what I do around. <laughs> you did that. Me and Ryan are helped <laughs> from that question. All right. Dale. Dale made a decision as to which of his two spare bedrooms to use as his dedicated home theater space. He went with our recommendation of the slightly larger room with a closet in the middle of the back wall and a single window on the left wall. He is hoping to set everything up soon, but his current Integra Pre-Pro, a DRC-R1.1, seems to have a completely dead HDMI board. Mm. Uh, HDMI dies so easily. And Onkyo slash Integra. <laughs> You're right. It was a warranty replacement unit for a DRC-R1.0 that had HDMI board problems of its own. But now it's well out of warranty, so it looks like it's time for a replacement. He wants to run a 5.2.4 configuration, and his nine-channel Integra amplifier is working perfectly. So which receiver, with pre-outs or pre-pro, would we recommend? There we go. There's There are several options for that. Well, and I mean, it really comes down to a question of, do you want HDMI 2.1 switching? Because uh, if you do, well, guess what? There's a brand new Denon X3800H that has come out. Um, if you diligently check around, there might still be some places when you're hearing this that that have some in stock. I mean, they that is one where they're that's like available now. It's just the first shipment pretty much everywhere got sold mm -hmm. out really darn quickly. Um, but like, you know, Amazon had a whole bunch of them and they, they quickly sold there. So just keep your eye, eyes peeled. If you want HDMI 2.1 switching, uh, then going for that X3800H is going to be the best deal in town that can do all the things that you want to do going up to more than seven speakers, having a full set of pre-outs, uh, an excellent full set of pre-outs. You can actually set the X3800H uh, to just pure pre-amplifier mode where it completely turns off its nine internal amplifiers and will just rely on the nine Integra amplifiers oh, that you have. Okay. So okay. It, it's got that option there. And then, of course, all of its HDMI ports now support 4K120, 8K60, so it's HDMI 2.1 across the board. Now, if you don't need uh, HDMI 2.1 switching because you're not a gamer or you only have one of the gaming consoles and that's enough and you don't need HDMI 2.1 switching, well, then you could save a little bit of money and get the X3700H because it too has the dedicated pre-amplifier mode if you want to use that, uh, has nine amplifiers built in, goes to 11 speakers if you want to. Uh, so right now it's only $100 cheaper if you're buying it brand new, but um, you can find the 3700H over at Accessories for Less for $1,200. So that's a significant saving. That's $500 less than the X3800H. Uh, and then there's the sister model if the X3700H is sold out at Accessories for Less. The Morant sister model is the SR6015, which also goes for $1,200 over at Accessories for Less. So one of those is the ones I'm going to point you to. It's going to be a Denon or Morant's, uh, probably the X3700H. But if you need HDMI 2.1 switching and you're willing to pay more, that X3800H is out now if it's only a hundred dollars more i'm a fan of throwing a hundred dollars at future proofing oh yeah i mean if, yeah. if you want hdmi 2.1 stuff then that's the way to go 
I mean, because eventually, you know, something <laughs> is coming along. All right. Can we do uh, maybe one or two more here? And I then certainly we'll... can. It's whatever okay. you like to do, Lee. <laughs> uh, I can do a couple more. Let's do a question for questions from RS and from I can't do this without doing Infinite Gary. So mm-hmm. if we could, well, let's let's do RS and let's do Infinite Gary and then we'll move on with life. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like a plan. See what happens next week, because uh, this podcast is, is interesting lately <laughs> with all that is going on. All right. Aris has just about finished his DIY enclosures for his in-ceiling KEF speakers so that they can be mounted as on-ceilings. He used half-inch thick Baltic birch with triangle corner braces inside, everything glued and screwed, and then a walnut veneer for the finish with high-gloss lacquer. And hey, kudos to you, man. Looking good. Uh, For the internal speaker wire that goes from the in-ceiling speaker to the binding posts he is going to install on one side of his DIY cabinets should he get speaker wire with spade connectors. The speaker wire connectors on the in-ceiling speakers themselves don't appear to accept banana plugs. Should he or does it matter? What you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as I know, the, the connections on the KEF in-ceiling speakers themselves are push binding posts where you, you push right. them in. They just want bare wire. Uh, they they oh, don't okay. want any any type of terminal, just bare wire. And for the internal connection to whatever binding posts you choose to install, usually that's just a bare wire connection too. Now, what I do recommend anytime you're doing an in-wall or in-ceiling installation is bare wire for the speaker wire itself, but then put a blob of the clear silicone on it. Uh, hmm. That's going to make sure that it never, ever comes loose, and it's going to make sure there's no chance of any electrical sparks, because the clear silicone is not electrically conductive. Uh, so, I mean, it just holds it there. It makes sure that nothing can really interfere, come loose, electrical arcing, or anything like that. And, you know, yes. clear silicone is not a difficult thing to do whatsoever. So, I would recommend just bare wire, and then a blob of clear silicone on all of the connections. There we go. That's easy enough. And then finally, today, <laughs> Infinite Gary. Gary came across a Q&A by Kevin Vokes. Hopefully I'm saying that right. I think From he Rebel. does it as Vakes, but that's Vakes. That's usually what I've heard, but I'm not All totally right. sure on that. Gary came across a Q&A by Kevin Vakes from (laughs) Revel, in which he explained how using multiple woofers can help to lower a speaker's dynamic compression. He explained how if a speaker dynamically compresses, its timbre actually changes depending on the output level, and that much of the dynamic compression is due to the voice coil heating up. So if you use multiple woofers versus just using a larger single woofer, that spreads out the heat and prevents dynamic compression. Hmm. So first of all, do we agree with all that? My eyebrow is going up right now, like, (laughs) hmm. And second, can you then tell, just by looking at speakers, say one with three six and a half inch woofers versus one with two eight inch woofers, which speaker will have less dynamic compression? My other eyebrow just went up on that question. (laughs) I'm thinking no. What you think, Rob? So, I mean, first of all, I mean, dynamic compression is a thing. It means that you're yes. reaching the physical, mechanical limits of a speaker driver, where the signal coming into the speaker is requesting that that driver move more, move farther in and out uh, for any given frequency, but it simply can't do it. It's just reached the limits or it's run out of power handling capability or just mechanical limits, can't mm. move any further. So if you were to measure just a frequency sweep at varying amplitude levels, would you start to see a change in the signal as you reach those electrical or mechanical limits? Yes, Mm. you absolutely would. We see this all the time in subwoofer burst measurements where they play that subwoofer louder and louder and louder, usually, you know, three or five decibel increases at a time. And eventually you just reach the limits of the driver where certain frequencies are able to get louder in response to that higher signal but other frequencies, it just can't get any louder. So gotcha. the shape of that graph does start to change. That That is absolutely a fact. And that is a way that you can view dynamic compression in a speaker in response to ever louder signals. Now, if you took like for like drivers, you have a, a single eight inch woofer and then you change it to a design with two of those same eight inch woofers, would that allow Uh, the speaker to play louder and absorb more power uh, in response to the signal getting louder. Yeah, I mean, it would. <laughs> you, mm-hmm. you now have, you know, parallel connections uh, uh, for, for for that electrical signal to go to. And yes, if you add more drivers, it will be able to play louder in response to the signal. But can you then 
just look at two completely different speakers, one of which has you know three woofers that are smaller versus two woofers that are larger, and come to any conclusion about which one has less dynamic compression? Absolutely, no. because you know different woofers have different excursion limits, different power handling capabilities, different sized voice coils, different materials. There's a gazillion variables going right. on where you absolutely cannot just look at the size or number of drivers from two completely different speakers and come to any conclusion about which one of them is able to play louder than the other. Um, so so that you definitely cannot do. But I mean, what Kevin Vakes is just saying about the basic objectives, uh, you know, where you measure the speaker at different signal and output levels, and then you add more drivers, already knowing what the original drivers were, and then you add more of them. Yeah, that that's all above board. That all makes total sense. I got you. Makes sense to me. Uh, is that enough questions for today? So you know what? I mean, like I wanted to get to one that's a little bit lower, but I know, Lee, you've got a, out uh, at this time, so it's not going to make any difference to our video. So <laughs> why don't... Okay, well, what, what's the other question you want to do? And can we do it right now? Oh, I sure. One if you're fine with it, then I wanted to do Dan's, or Dane's question, sorry. Dane's Dane. question, not a problem. Yeah. Let's do Dane's question. Perfect. I, I'm, you know, I don't have to run, but you know, it's getting about time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and by the way, everyone, just... Rob is such a trooper. I need you to know that I'm looking at a man sitting in his car right uh -huh. now. He is so dedicated to this situation. <laughs> Starting to form some sweat up here, too, because it's not cool inside of this car cabin. He is not comfortable, but he is working hard for you so that you learn more about audio and video. It's just kind of amazing. I'm just so impressed. Uh, here's a question from Dane. Dane is having a TV installed above his fireplace. Mm -hmm. hmm, that sounds familiar. He'll have an HDMI cable run inside the wall about 20 feet long, and he's going to have conduit installed where possible. He'd like the connections at the wall to be really clean, so can we recommend any HDMI wall plates? He doesn't have any current plans for 4K 120 or VRR. And hopefully the conduit will make it easier to upgrade if he ever needs to. So while we're at it, could we also suggest an in-wall HDMI cable that would work for him? And yes, of course, and it's not even that expensive. I don't think it's overly expensive, and uh, I am going to suggest HDMI 2.1 capable equipment in all of this case, because yeah. you know what? Why not try to be as future-proof as you can be if it isn't overly expensive to do so? Exactly. Always the case, yeah. Cable Matters, good company, Cable Matters, they have just basic keystone uh, HDMI couplers uh, that go for $10 for two of them that are yeah. HDMI 2.1, 48 gigabit per second ready. Now, I don't think $10 is too much of an asking price. You will have to, of course, uh, just get a regular Keystone style wall plate, but those are readily available, including from Cable Matters, if you want to keep it all in the same brand. Uh, but the $10 is just for the two little couplers that fit into any standard Keystone wall plate that would go on there. So those are a really simple connection. They really are just a coupler. Uh, so there, there's nothing like electrical or boosting or anything going on inside of those, which is part of why they're so inexpensive. Uh, but a lot of the K, uh, couplers that are out there are only rated for HDMI 2.0. And these ones from Cable Matters are rated for HDMI 2.1. So why not? when it's only 10 bucks for a couple of them. Uh, yes. So for the cable that will be going inside of your wall, and he was saying he needs it to be about 20 feet long, thankfully, one thing to note, with those cable matter couplers is they are completely passive. So they are unlikely to work with any active HDMI cables, the ones mm. that uh, one right. side of it is labeled source and the other side of it uh, you know, is labeled display. Right. And the display side has to be plugged into a port that provides power to that active HDMI cable. With the cable matters couplers, you're going to only want to use passive HDMI cables. Right. Uh, but thankfully, Zeskit has an HDMI 2.1, an ultra high speed certified with the hologram and the QR code and everything that is passive, 23 feet long and Perfect. in wall CL3 rated. So that's all the things that you need from this cable. Perfect. And it's $55, which I don't think is too crazy. You no, know? for that and being rated for 2.1, yeah. come on. Perfect. So that's the one, it, it, I have to warn you, it is rather thick and stiff. I have dealt with the Zeskit uh, HDMI 2.1 passive cables that are 16 feet or longer, and they are quite thick and stiff, but 
it's going inside your wall. You're not going to have in... to deal with moving it around <laughs> outside. And, and he's got... using conduit, so... That's right. And you've got it's the three extra so feet, which might be beneficial, because some of those curves might need to be kind of gentle and wide. So yeah. I, I think that's checking all the boxes. Like I say, 55 bucks, really not asking too much. So those two things together, you've kind of future-proofed yourself as much as you reasonably can at this point. I will warn you... If you've got one of the Cable Matters couplers on the wall up by the television, and then another one, the second one, you know, down by your AV equipment, a lot of people have reported if you actually are trying to do like 4K 120, that having the two couplers, um, you know, depending on what cables you're using, it can get a little bit flaky when you're getting to that 40 gigabits, 48 gigabits type of thing. It can start to get a bit questionable there because, you know, like that 23 foot length is about as long as any passive HDMI 2.1 cable can get. And now yeah. you are putting it into a coupler and an additional HDMI cable on either end you know effectively lengthening it and putting it through a coupler so i do have to warn you in the future 4k 120 might be a bit flaky on you but for now when you're saying you're not even worried about that and you're going to be doing 4k 60 this should definitely work just fine and makes you about as future proof as you possibly can be yeah that is a dollar figure where i don't mind future proofing right <laughs> that's yes. not a problem at all that <laughs> seems kind of perfect great all right Hey, that's a pretty good little podcast given this situation. I hope so. We, I mean, you know, we, it's, it's got to be better than absolutely nothing. Um, I mean, literally, when the two main guys on this podcast, <laughs> neither one of them are in their homes. Nope. And we can still pull off a podcast by by calling in the pinch hitter in Alabama. <laughs> that's that's dedication to a podcast, people. I really, I, I need you all to know. Rob is in his car yep. <laughs> and he is still serving you. And Tom <laughs> is escaping a deadly hurricane. Oh gosh, I hope he's and okay. He will, I'm sure he's going to be fine. I'm sure the family's going to be fine and, and they will get back to it as soon as he can. Mm -hmm. uh, when I asked him via text, whether he was, you know, hunkering down or evacuating. And if he wanted to go so far as to come to Tuscaloosa, he could stay with me. <laughs> uh, his, his only response was just the abbreviated word evac. Yep. So that's how busy his situation Indeed. is. Indeed. Yes. And yet you're still getting good audio video information. So there you go. <laughs> if I'm just, not good I'm uh, audio quality from me. Well, uh, but... who knows? We'll see what we're going to be able to hear. It seems as Lee was able to hear me throughout this thing. So something must have oh, functioned yeah. at the very least. Every word. I could hear every <laughs> word. I hope you can hear me. My audio levels are oddly a little low. Uh, I can fix it. No problem. So I did want to mention uh, two more questions were left on the list that we'll get to next week. Those are from Matt and from Luke. So you two gentlemen will be first up next week. And of course, we want to head back up and... And thank our listeners of the week, people who supported this podcast in some way. Those would include our 138 Patreon patrons. That is patreon.com slash avrantpodcast if you'd like to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. So a big thanks to our 138 patrons over there. Uh, thank you to Dale P for sending me an Amazon Canada gift card. So that's very, yeah. very nice of you. I appreciate that very much. And we want to say uh, thank you to the people who sent us notes of gratitude for keeping this podcast going through thick and thin. So Dale, Aris, Jim, Gorinder, Dale P, Daz, Matt, Luke, and Greg, and Nathan. Thank you all so yeah. much for sending in those notes of gratitude to us. A big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. And thank this has been Lee fun Overstreet. again. Lee Overstreet. Lee oh, Overstreet for pinch hitting for us. Thank Man, you, Man, I love, I love the opportunity. It's fun to do this every time. And again, I just... I've I got to help out when I'm impressed with what everybody's going through mm. and we're still keeping this going. So this has been great. And anytime you just holler and I'll run in here and turn on a microphone. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, <laughs> for AV rant in behalf of Tom H, I am Robbie uh, Tom H. Is that what I just said? Yeah. Got to stumble yep, at the end of the podcast. Him. That is not here. appropriate. <laughs> nope. Nope. For, for Tom Andrew, that's the real person here. AV rant. I am Rob H. And I'm Lee Overstreet. Now go out and listen to something.